Guys, thank you for coming today. I know it's the 4th of July. Uh, you guys probably have stuff going on later on today, but I really do genuinely appreciate you guys taking the time to be here. Uh, it means a lot to me, so thank you very much. Uh, this is the second volume of Weight Room Training is Gait Training. You do not have to have seen the first one. It's gonna help, but I'm gonna tackle everything. So if you're totally fresh, that's great. The first thing we're gonna get into is biomechanics. We need to understand some very basic things so the rest of this presentation makes sense. So let's talk about pelvic mechanics first. So your pelvis has two sort of phases that it can go into, and that is expansion and compression. I'm gonna say these words a lot over the next hour or so. So your sacrum can do two main things. It can nutate and flex forward, or it can counter nutate and extend backwards. Now, when it nutates forward, that's considered flexion. Your anomina bones right here are gonna follow it into internal rotation, adduction, and extension. So that's kind of similar to what happens in an exhale. When we exhale, this is what happens to a slight extent. When we inhale, we're going to have more counter nutation, abduction, flexion, and um, external rotation at our nominate bones. So this is what happens when we inhale, this is what happens when we exhale. Expansion, compression. This is gonna matter a lot for the gait cycle. Now, in terms of femoral mechanics, it's really in gait, we think about the femur moving a lot, but it's really the pelvis moving over a fixed femur. So it's gait is really this action going on in our pelvis. When we strike the ground, our pelvis is mostly off of our femur. As we progress towards the middle of the gait cycle, our pelvis moves over our femur. And then as we progress back off of it, we start to finish or end the gait cycle on that side. And that's going to be really important. In PRI terms, they refer to this as acetabular femoral external rotation and then internal rotation. So you don't really need to know those terms, just know that the pelvis is doing a lot of the movement over a fixed femur in gait. In terms of tibia and foot mechanics, we're gonna be looking at how the tibia and the foot act together in unison. So in early and late stance, the tibia is gonna be in more external rotation. The foot is gonna be in more supination. As we progress towards mid stance, the tibia is gonna go in more IR, leading to more pronation at the foot. And then as we finish the gait cycle and toe off, it's gonna be more supinated again. So now let's talk about assessments. So we have these two ideas of expansion. We have this idea of compression right? But individuals are going to be biased towards one or the other. And we kind of want to meet them where they're at. If you guys are familiar with the idea of infrasternal angles, it's kind of a similar, similar idea, but I'm not going to go too deep into that. I'm going to give you guys three really easy assessments you can use on anyone, and you're going to get a good idea of where they're biased. This first one is called an active knee to chest. This is going to be testing for expansion. So what you're gonna do is lay on the ground and try and actively pull your knee to your chest. The goal is 120 degrees. You wanna keep this hamstring nice and flat on the floor. Now you'll see that when I go through this, I'm really done right about there, right about eh, maybe 95, 100 degrees. Beyond that, my hamstring starts to come off of the floor. That's an indication that I'm cheating to get that extra range of motion. So you gotta make sure that this person's uh, leg stays flat on the floor. The goal is 120 degrees because that is representing the ability to expand your pelvis. So we want to use this as an assessment of can this person access expansion? They can't get to 120, they cannot. If they get stuck before that, that's going to be more compressive. Active straight leg raise. Now this is testing for compression. There's something called the screw home mechanism. So your, your femur and your tibia are gonna kind of lock together when you straighten out your knee, which is gonna bias your femur into internal rotation. Now, you'll see that the goal is 90 to 100 degrees. So for me, I get stuck eh, maybe 60 or so. So I can't do this. I could cheat like that and I could get it all the way up, but that's not actually a genuine test. We wanna keep that other leg down, which is a true range of motion assessment. So we're testing for the ability to go into nutation here on that side. So if we get to 90 to 100 degrees, we're getting into more of that internal rotation and nutation on that side of the active leg. 
toe touch to squat, this is kind of a two in one, but I think this is a really great assessment because this is gonna test for two separate things. The first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is do a toe touch. This is testing for nutation. So right there, I've got my toe touch because I'm a compressed individual. I can get my sacrum to nutate and go into internal rotation so that I can actually do this test. But you'll see once I go into the squat, it's not happening. I get stuck here because I'm biased towards compression. Someone who's expanded probably wouldn't be able to touch their toes because they're biased towards this counter mutated state, but they'd be able to squat because they're biased towards expansion and a squat is more of an expansive, um, it's more of an expansive exercise. So if we're going to be biased towards expansion, you're going to see them pass their, their active knee to chest and their squat. They're going to go ass to grass. If they're going to, they're probably going to fail the active straight leg raise and they're not going to be able to touch their toes. If someone is more compression biased, they're going to probably pass their active straight leg raise and probably their toe touch. But if they fail it, if they fail their active knee to chest and squat, that's a indication they can't access expansion mechanics. And you're probably saying, well, what do you mean all this different expansion mechanics and compression mechanics? Well, it's really about what this person is biased towards, right? So if they're more biased towards expansion, they're gonna be more biased towards external rotation, abduction and flexion. That's going to be better than those other compressive measurements. So these individuals are probably really good at absorbing force, but not necessarily producing it. Think about a marathon runner, right? Think about that thinner, taller sort of, it's probably going to be more of a spectrum, right? So this is gonna be more thinner, taller females. If you can imagine a spectrum from here onto a spectrum of compression, which is your sort of larger males. So that's gonna be more of a compressed individual. And in some, most people are somewhere in between. So these expansion biased individuals probably are going to need more mid and late stance training. They need more internal rotation adductors and probably some hamstrings too for some hip extension. So compression biased individuals are gonna be the inverse of that. Think about like a power lifter or a defensive tackle, someone who's really good at producing force because that's their job, but not necessarily great at absorbing it. So they probably need more early and mid stance training and we will get into what that entails in a second. So they probably need more ER, abductors, and oh, they also need hamstrings. And there's a reason for that. Because as human beings, we're really trying to do three things. We're trying to survive, reproduce, and go forward. So the reason why we see anterior pelvic tilt so much in, in postures is because the human body loves to go forward. If we have constraints on our system that are limiting our range of motion and movement options, we're probably going to find a way to go forward via the path of least resistance. For a lot of people, that's an anterior pelvic tilt. Now, let's go over a gait overview. Let's review gait. So, heel strike is the first thing that happens in gait. When we strike the ground with our heel, our sacrum is going to be biased towards more of a counter mutated state on that side. I'm going to use the left side of my pelvic model here to represent this. We're going to be biased more like this. So when we strike the ground, this anomaly is going to be more in ER abduction and flexion. But heel strike is a heavy eccentric phase of gait because what happens is when we strike the ground, we need to start to slow down on that side so we can advance the other side forward. So we have very little concentric activity during this phase of gait. Very, very little. It's heavily eccentric, and this is gonna matter for training later. But as we strike the ground and we start to progress more towards the middle of our foot, our acetabulum is moving over the femur, so we're going from this expanded state and we're moving towards more of a compressed one. As we complete mid-stance phase of gait, the anomaly is going to be in more internal rotation, adduction, and extension, and the sacrum is gonna be in more of this nutated state, this forward state. So we're gonna have concentric activity of the proximal fibers of our hamstring for hip extension. We're gonna have more internal rotation activity. Your anterior glute med is more of a compressive uh, fibers of your muscle. Your posterior glute med is more of an expansive muscle. It's going to be more of an external rotator, whereas the anterior glute me is more of an internal rotator. So this eccentric activity through the glute max, calves, hip, abductors, and adductors 
is going to still help slow us down so we can advance the other side forward. Finally, in late stance, this is going to be that concentric external rotation abduction activity. This is where we are pushing off and then we're just going to restart the phase on the other side. So after we pass mid stance, we begin to recounter nutate and go into this expansion phase on this side. So as you can tell, in this sort of foot progression right here, we strike the lateral outside heel and then we eventually pronate and then we go onto the ball, the big toe here where we push off and then we resupinate. Now, this is something that I've taken from Bill Hartman, um, Zach Couples, guys like that. They talk about the limb arc model. Now, this is a representation of the gait cycle, but it's also a representation of humeral flexion. It's also a representation of a squat. A squat is probably the easiest possible way to look at this. So just imagine we're going through a squat, right? So the first zero to 60 degrees of a squat needs to be more expansive, just like early stance. So we're going to go into this orientation. The sacrum is going to tip back. Now, as we pass 60 degrees and approach 90, we start to go towards more internal rotation, adduction, and extension, and the sacrum is going to nutate forward. And then after we get towards more of, of the bottom of a squat, we're going to go towards more expansive mechanics again. Now, if you think of the assessments, let's go back to those. Why did I struggle to get past 90 degrees of hip flexion when I did my squat? That's because I'm biased towards mid stance and compression and exhalation mechanics. I'm biased towards a nutated sacrum. So for me to go any lower in that squat, I would just round my back because I can't reaccess counter nutation. So I would just butt wink in an attempt to find that counter nutation because I can't get that relative motion within my pelvis. Similarly, you can think of someone who's biased towards expansion. Why would they struggle with something that's more compressive like a deadlift? They might want to round their back in a deadlift because if they're going to be more biased towards expansion, counter mutated sacrum, a flat, you know, more of a flat lumbar, then when you put them in a hinge position and then they go to pull, then they're going to really struggle to not round their low back because they can't get flexion at their sacrum. So they're finding flexion one joint higher at their low back. So this really applies to a lot of things. It's not just gait. You can take this model and apply it to so many things. Let's think about another, another example. Why would a barbell bench press hurt someone like my shoulders? Because a barbell bench press is internal rotation, adduction, and extension. And when I go to barbell bench press a lot, I'm pushing myself into this compressive state that I'm already in. So that's going to, that's going to lock up my shoulders even more. Whereas if you gave me a Swiss bar or a neutral grip, if you gave me some of these expansive mechanics like supination at my forearm, I might be able to bench press without pain because you're giving me what I don't have. So hopefully that gets your brain churning a little bit as to how these things apply. This is gait mechanics. This is squat mechanics. This is just human movement. Now, let's talk about training gait. There's going to be a lot of things we talk about here, but I'm going to put it all together for you guys at the end, so don't worry. So foot references. Now, when we're thinking about um, the gait cycle in this image right here, if we're going to be in more supination and we're feeling more of our heel that's going to be more of that early mid stance. It's going to be hard to cue someone in an exercise. Hey, feel your mid foot. People are going to be like, what does that even mean? So usually I either cue heels or that ball of the big toe. So if I want more early or mid stance bias, I'm going to give them more of a heel reference. That's going to give me more hamstrings, internal rotators, adductor. And then forefoot or more of a pronation bias with that big toe is going to be more of that late stance. So in a squat, I usually like to cue load on your heels, push through more of your forefoot. That's more accurate and that is more, um, that's more representative of what goes on in the gait cycle. Now pelvic references, this is huge. So we have two ways we can orient our pelvis similar to the gait cycle. We can move our pelvis over the femur or we can move it off of the femur. If we're gonna move it over the femur, 
in that acetabular femoral internal rotation, that's what's referred to as a hip shift. So right there in this position, I'm going to be getting a lot, and I go into a little hand here, I'm going to be getting a lot of adductor internal rotators. Pelvis is over the femur. Now, I could do the opposite. I could back my pelvis off of my femur right here. And that's going to bias me towards of more of that expansion in my pelvis, right? So here I would be getting more of those AB ductors, glute max, et cetera. So this is one way we can change the pelvic position, have the same exact exercise, but totally change the outcome of what we're doing. Now, more of a posterior tilt, I like to call more early and mid stance. Anterior tilt is going to be more of a late stance. I usually don't cue too much of an anterior tilt uh, because people love to go into extension, as I said earlier. People love anterior pelvic tilt as it is. But generally speaking, if you get people in this sort of AFER position, this sort of late stance position, they're going to sort of naturally gravitate towards more of an anterior tilt. Load references. So the side in which we hold the weight is going to matter. So if I hold the weight contralaterally in the other hand of my stance foot, so if I'm going my left foot out and I hold the weight in my right hand, that's going to bias me towards early and mid stance because it provides a counterbalance for me to get more heel reference and more of that forward hip shift. This is going to increase my ability to get hamstring, adductor, and internal rotation activity. So this is a really good way to not coach anything and still get the outcome that you're looking for simply because of the counterbalance, simply because of the weight, the constraint we're placing on the system. If we do ipsilateral loading, same side, you feel like you're falling to that side a lot because not only is that leg forward, but that weight is pulling you over to that side. So naturally you have to gravitate towards more of your foot, uh, your weight on your forefoot and arch. So this is a really good way to get that big toe reference and get more of that late stance. This is going to increase glute max, abductor, and external rotator activity. I love using this as a way to just bias positions, just provide a constraint. If you did bilateral load, then I would probably not worry about this, and I would probably worry more about these other references we're talking about. We could also use bands. So we could use a band to bias certain activity. This band is pulling my leg outward, so I have to keep it inward, and I'm getting more adduction internal rotation activity. If I put a band around both knees in something like a goblet squat, that would be biasing my pelvis as a whole towards more expansion. But I'm not going to jam my knees out over my way outside my toes, right? Because then that would just be a ton of concentric glute max activity. I would just be doing this instead of just opening up my pelvis a little bit, keeping my knees in line with my toes, I don't wanna have a bunch of heavy concentric glute max activity on the eccentric portion of a squat. That wouldn't make much sense. But if I keep my knees in line with my toes, I can bias maybe someone like me who's biased towards nutation and all these extension compressive mechanics, I can open myself up a little bit. We could also think about using a roller or a ball. I love this to bias mid stance, single leg stance mechanics, because you can see right here, especially with this contralateral load, I have to push into this roller if I'm gonna get, if, I'm, if this roller is not gonna drop. So I'm using this, I'm sorry about that. I'm using this as a means to train adduction and internal rotation activity. You could also put a ball in between the knees on something like a squat to bias them towards those compressive mechanics. Grip. Grip is also going to be something we can think about here. A pronated grip, if we think about that bench press example I used, that's going to be more internal rotation, adduction, and extension going on. A wider grip, too, is also going to bias our scapula towards more of a down and back orientation, more of a exhaled orientation, more of a compressive orientation. So if we can think about doing something like a wide grip barbell back squat, SSB back squat, things like that, snatch grip deadlift, that's all going to bias us towards more compressive mechanics. 
A neutral grip would be moving towards supination, and then a supinated grip would be more ER abduction and flexion. So think about narrower grips. Your scaps are gonna come apart from each other. You're gonna get more expansive mechanics back there. So think about a narrow grip pal-off press with a supinated grip. Just trying to give you guys some ideas of things to think about. I'm not going too much into the upper body today because that would be a ton of things to think about. Uh, but these are just things you can think about and how you can bias certain positions. Now, this is really the meat and potatoes. I'm going to be talking a lot about split squats here. Now, if we elevate just the front heel, then we are going to have more of this negative tibia angle where it comes back. We're going to have a lot of weight being pushed on this back foot too, and that's totally okay. So we're doing toe off in the back, heel strike in the front bias because plantar flexion is more associated with that heel strike. So this is going to be more of expansive pelvic mechanics. Remember how eccentric heavy this heel strike is. So I could even get more by doing a backwards hip shift, that AFER hip shift. That will bias me even more towards heel strike and expansive pelvic mechanics. I could do a front foot elevated reference. Now we can change this to early or mid stance depending on what we're going for. If we wanted more mid stance, I would cue more weight over this front heel because this is gonna give me that vertical tibia angle just like it is in mid stance. I could do a forward hip shift and that's gonna give me that eccentric adductor activity that's also gonna give me a more proximal hamstring that's also gonna give me more internal rotation activity. So that would be a good cue if we want to get someone towards that mid stance. If we want more early stance, we could do a backwards hip shift. We could move the pelvis off of the femur as opposed to over it in mid stance. That would help put more weight on the rear foot again. And that would again bias us towards those more expansive musculature. And that's also going to give us more of a negative tibia angle. Now, in terms of rear foot elevated reference, that is going to give us more of a mid or late stance bias. So we could forward hip shift in this, and that's gonna bring our pelvis back a little bit, and that's gonna give us more of a vertical tibia angle. So that's gonna give us more mid stance mechanics. We're gonna get more adductor, internal rotator, and hamstring. Or we could not do a hip shift at all. Or we could do a backward hip shift and that would give us more of that positive tibia angle. That's gonna give us more of a four foot reference and then that's gonna give us more glute max, abductor, quads. So just by messing around with these positions, we can get someone into a totally different outcome. So just to review, if we're thinking about getting more eccentric glute max, quad, hamstring activity, then we could bias them towards early stance. We would want a negative tibia angle, a heel reference focus, more of a backward hip shift, contralateral loading, and supination and plantar flexion. That doesn't mean we have to have all these things. It's just these are going to bias us towards early stance. If we wanted more mid stance, this is gonna be best for eccentric adductor activity, concentric proximal hamstrings and internal rotation activity, hip extension. So the references for this would be a vertical tibia angle, heel and midfoot reference focus, a forward hip shift and contralateral loading, and then more pronation and dorsiflexion. Finally, if we wanted to bias late stance, we would wanna think about doing more concentric glute max, quads, abductors, more distal hamstrings. So we're gonna get more of a positive tibia angle here. We're gonna get more of a big toe reference, more of a backward hip shift or just none at all, and ipsilateral loading, same side loading, and then more supination plantar flexion. If we're on our forefoot, we're going to be biasing more of that plantar flexion. Now, here's a couple of examples of warm-up drills that we can use, positional drills, we can use breathing drills we can use to bias us in certain phases. Here's a supine hamstring bridge. 
So with this, this is bilateral heel reference. I'm getting that posterior pelvic tilt and I'm reaching straight up. So this is gonna give me abs and hamstrings. I'm exhaling, feeling my obliques kick on, staying nice and relaxed. That's the thing, we gotta stay chill on these activities. Because if we're treating them like a strength activity, our brain's gonna lock up. Like that's a sympathetic fight or flight response. I like in these positional drills just to cue relaxation, feel them, sense them. They're highly sensory motor. They're highly just, you know, sense the right things, create a neurological association. I want my brain to go, okay, I'm feeling heels, concentric hamstring, and I'm feeling abs. Great. This is great for taking someone on an anterior pelvic tilt orientation, bring the, their pelvis back to neutral. Great deadlift prep right here. So this is a PRI activity called the sideline adductor pullback. This is a mid stance bias. So here I'm having a ball in between my knees. I have my heels on the wall. I'm reaching to get abs on the top side. I'm going to inhale. I'm going to pull back on this ball, get my adductor going. I'm going to exhale and push down. This is great for someone who's lacking compressive mechanics on one or both sides. If they're missing on just one, I'd give it on that side. If they're missing on both, I'd give this bilaterally. This is a really good warm-up drill, especially with someone with a hip shift. Someone's got a hip shift going on, then they're probably just biased towards more of that mutation on one side, counter mutation on the other. So if we can get them to have more compression on the other side, you can even them out. This is sort of a core and also a good uh, oblique activity. This is an example of how you can get something going on on one side and the opposite happening on the other. So look at how I've got this arch reference here. I've got glute max in this position right here. I keep this leg up because I'm getting adductor and I'm also getting obliques on this side. So look, I'm kind of more expansive on my right side and more compressed on my left side. This is another PRI drill called a reciprocal step through. I love to use this with people that have a lot of upright activity going on in their lives, like runners. So here I'm shifting, I'm getting in that mid stance. I'm, I have this plate right here because usually if you put a plate underneath someone, that helps bring the floor up to them so they can sense their heel better. So here I'm just going back and forth, going from toe, to heal, what does this look like? This looks like walking to me. I'm feeling those mid stance muscles. I'm feeling my adductor, feeling my anterior glute med, feeling some hamstring and I'm feeling some abs. I tell runners, if you can't do this for two minutes and still feel all these muscles, how can you expect to go on a two mile, five mile, 10 mile run and still be able to shift into your hip? It's not gonna happen. So we've gotta be able to do this and do it for a decent amount of time. So now let's go through some basic progressions. We're gonna talk about squats primarily here. So if I had someone that was biased towards compression, like myself, and I wanted to get them more expansive, then a good initial progression would be a goblet squat to a 60 to 90 degree box with my heels elevated and a band around the knees. Let's break that down. So 60 to 90 degrees would depend on the individual and how, you know, you don't want to break things down too much and make it too much of a slow process for someone who is, you know, a fairly well-trained individual. But if I have them just day one, then I'm probably going to have them just squat to as low as they can or as high as they comfortably can. So a heels elevated position is going to bias them towards plantar flexion. And then a band around the knees is going to bias them towards more expansive mechanics. Then from there, I'm gonna go into more of a zercher position where they're holding something low, whether that be a, a cable pulling them down or a barbell. And then I'm gonna to go to, towards more of a 120 degree zone. Because if you think of the limb arc model, 120 degrees of hip flexion is going to be associated with more expansive mechanics. A zercher squat is a really good way to get someone to keep that vertical, uh, vertical uh, rib cage stack over a pelvis. Heels elevated, band around the knees again. Great secondary progression there. Then we would go to a front squat, to a 120 degree box. Again, heels elevated. I would use more of a supinated strap grip because very few people have the ability to get that clean grip effectively. So I would supinate the strap grip. 
finally, I would take the box away, keep their heels elevated, and we just get after it with a front squat or SSB squat. Now, if we had the opposite of me and we had someone that was more expansion focused and I wanted to give them more compression, I would have them goblet squat to a 90 degree box with a ball between their knees. And the ball wouldn't be anything that would have them be a big valgus collapse in their knees where their knees are coming in. It would probably be a ball the size of something that would help them keep their knees relatively in line with their toes. And then that 90 degree box, 90 degrees of hip flexion is where internal rotation, adduction, and pelvic extension is going to be maximized. Why do someone's knees cave in at a squat? They usually have to the sticking point of the squat, which is what? Around 90 degrees. That's the hardest part. And that's associated with internal rotation, adduction, and extension. So if your pelvis doesn't have the internal rotation that it needs, your knees are probably going to cave in so that you can find that compensatory internal rotation. So I like to just give them that pelvic compression through something like a ball to a 90 degree box. After that, I would do a SSB squat to, again, a 90 degree box with a snatch grip. That's more pronation internal rotation. I could also use a barbell. That 90 degree box is gonna be huge because we're driving home compressive mechanics. And then I would go to a 120 degree box because by then, I usually progress things in about four to six week blocks. So by now, it's probably been somewhere between eight to 12 weeks. They're probably ready to get more expansive again. I'm gonna take them down to that 120 degrees, the end range of that compression zone. And then we're gonna to go to a front squat, more of a pronated grip like so. Now for a unilateral lower push for someone like me who's compressed and I want more expansion, I'm going to think about doing something like the single arm zercher split squat in early stance. So let's take a look at this. this is pretty straightforward. So here I've got an ipsilateral load. I love this so much because I'm keeping my rib cage back because that cable is forcing me to do so. If I didn't keep my rib cage stacked over my pelvis, I would just fall forward or extend my low back. So I love this because this ipsilateral load actually allows me to get that backward hip shift a little bit more. It would be a little bit harder to do that with a contralateral. So here I'm breaking the rules slightly, but again, I'm trying to illustrate that it's just a menu. We have this big wide varying menu of things we can do, all these different constraints and references to get the outcome that we want. So here I'm biasing myself towards more of that heel strike. I could also elevate my heel here. Then I would go towards more of a front foot elevated split squat, biasing it towards early stance with a backwards hip shift and more of that ipsilateral load again so I could get more of a backwards hip shift. I could do contralateral load, sure. But I like that for the backwards hip shift, the ipsilateral load. Now, Front foot elevated split squat in mid stance would be next. I would do a forward hip shift with a contralateral load. I think that one makes sense, right? So I'm pushing my pelvis over my femur and with that contralateral, contralateral load, that's even easier. And then I'm getting that vertical tibia angle. After that, I'm probably ready to progress towards a rear foot elevated split squat in late stance ready to train myself in more of those mechanics because we've gone through all the phases of gait. So now I would probably do a backwards hip shift or maybe none at all with a bilateral load, get some more load in there as well. We have to understand too that people don't want to always have things be so intricate. So this is probably like as intricate as I would make it for the average person because at some point people do just want to push the weight and have some fun. So a unilateral lower push, which is more compression focused for someone who's more expanded, I would do something like that single arm search or split squat in early stance, ipsilateral load, just not do a backwards hip shift because we do want them to get a little bit more compression and I'm not going to bias them towards a ton of expansion if I'm getting them, if I'm trying to get them towards more uh, compression. But I do like this as an initial progression because it teaches them how to keep that stack. It teaches them how to keep their rib cage over their pelvis, which is a huge factor I go for very early on in my programs. After that, I'm going to go to a front foot elevated split squat in more mid stance. I'm going to do a higher box, probably because that's going to give me more of that internal rotation. So if I can bias myself on a high box, 
Let's see if I can go all the way back. If I get myself starting at about 90 degrees of hip flexion, then I'm going to be maximizing that internal rotation and compressive activity. Whereas if I just elevated a little bit, sure, I might get a little bit more, I might get compression, but I'm not maximizing it because I'm starting in that compression zone or maximizing our time within it. Oops. We're getting there. Okay, after that, I would think about doing a rear foot elevated split squat in mid stance again, mid stance compression zone, right? So I would do a forward hip shift with a contralateral load. Again, biasing them more towards mid stance. After that, I would do a rear foot elevated split squat with late stance, bilateral load, good final progression. They're ready to rock and roll by this point. But what if we had a mixed assessment result? What if, what if we're thinking about asymmetry? One side needs more than the other usually. And what about the upper body? What about core training? Well, that's what this is for, guys. If you are interested in these things, if this is fascinating to you and you want to learn more, today is when I'm opening up my signups for the August through October group program. It's three months long. It's a, there's a weekly presentation just like this, very similar to this. And there's notes in a study guide provided. There's small group discussion. And there's example programs and exercises. We get into the weeds way more than this. And it's a lot of fun. So early bird pricing is going on right now. You can open up uh, the link I will send you in an email right after this. I'm only taking 25 people. So the earlier, the better really for this. Um, 100 bucks a month for three months. And then you'll have a bunch of slides and presentations just like this one. This is the material we will cover in the order. So we're gonna start off with biomechanical respiration strategies. We're gonna get into infrasternal angles a lot. Then we're gonna get into more PRI concepts, asymmetrical pelvis and rib cage, a much deeper and in-depth assessment protocol, thinking about how we manage pain and injuries, exercise selection, more so the respiratory exercises, warm-ups, cool downs, things like that. Then we get into the weight room. Then we get into some really cool energy system with occlusion, uh, thinking about how we're gonna use um, sort of like blood flow and all these fun things to maximize these principles that we're talking about programming, putting it all together through case studies and examples, psychology, and then finishing up with business and marketing. If you guys are interested in this, I will be sending out an email right after this. And you guys will be able to sign up. You will get first dibs. Again, only 25 spots. Guys, thank you for coming. Thank you for listening to my spiel. Uh, really does mean a lot. Like, thank you so much for being here. I hope you guys have a great fourth and I will be here for questions if you guys have any. It's an open forum, so feel free to unmute Hello? yourself and just ask questions. Hello? What's up, Chris? Yeah, I just want to uh, tell everybody that um, don't wait. It's a really good idea to sign up. I've been um, doing this with Connor for about three, four months, and it's really great. You will really learn a lot, and you would increase your... Uh, potential with training any type of client so don't wait it's a good deal thank you man i really thank you i genuinely appreciate that man i'm here for any questions i know that was i know that was a lot of information guys uh but i hope you understand it's just about principles right you can make exercises up as long as you understand these principles Adam, I don't think we can, I can see you talking. I just can't hear you. Yeah, I still can't hear you. You might want to type it in the chat. Any questions? I know you guys got them. If you ask him, I bet someone else is thinking the same thing. I bet you. For someone who is struggling to get depth in a squat and you were to choose a loaded split squat variation, would you load contralaterally or ipsilaterally? Great question. I would definitely do a front foot elevated squat and I would probably have them do something contralaterally um, or something in sort of like a Jefferson position, right? So I could, 
One of my favorite go-tos for improving squat depth, I would elevate the foot, hold the weight right here, and then I would have them sink down, get deep in that hip flexion, come up. That will improve their squat immediately. Uh, for the exercise lying on your back with your heels on a roller, uh, is there a reason? Yes, yes, there is a big reason for that. And the fact is I really, the more I do, uh, positional drills and the more I coach people through them, the more I hate the 90, 90 hip lift. It is such a, <laughs> it's such a tedious exercise to coach someone through. And a lot of people have a really hard time, even a well-executed 90, 90 hip lift. Like it's just the amount of hamstrings you're going to get on a roller compared to a wall is absolutely dramatic. Um, it, it, you just get so much more. And again, you got to think about what hip flexion you're getting them into, right? So maybe if I'm getting someone that needs more expansion, I would get them in that position. Someone that needs more compression, I might want to think about 90 degrees of hip flexion. Um, for the three months, what is the daily time commitment? So we have a weekly hour meeting, then you will guys will probably have somewhere between a half an hour to an hour of a small group meeting. Um, I have the time, just it's totally up to what you guys want to do. I send out a poll with a bunch of different times and the best time available wins. I record all of them, so if you guys can't make one, uh, it will be available within a Google Drive folder. Yeah. If a foot is overpronating because the foot has a problem finding the medial arch, um, taking your, your PRI reciprocal walk, would you put a sock or something soft underneath the big toe? Yes. So you guys know, if you guys know Neil Hollinan, not Hollinan, I still don't know how to say his last name. Uh, but if you guys look at his YouTube video of making a paper towel arch, that is a really good tactic. I have cleared up a lot of pronation issues just by folding up a paper towel, putting it in their sock underneath their arch and having them do something. That is a very good tactic. But again, that's kind of like a band aid. Uh, I wouldn't want someone doing that for the rest of their lives, but it's a good kind of stop gap while you work on actually improving true pronation. Any other questions? For someone rehabbing long-term groin pain who has minimal contact with their base of first, and has large valgus during a squat and favors a posterior pelvic tilt during running. That sounds at least to me like someone who is expanded, right? So let's break that down. So uh, if you're biased towards counter mutation, then your pelvis is going to be kind of like this, right? So if that person has a valgus in their squat, think about this. Look at how much room I have to pick up ER in this position. There's not a whole lot of room for me to get IR. My model doesn't want to go much further back here, but I have plenty of room for ER. Now, my pelvic floor here is also going to be drooped down. Our guts need to sink down when we inhale, and they need to come up when we exhale, and they need to come up when we produce force. So if we can't find IR through our pelvis and femurs, then that valgus collapse is probably an attempt to find that compression and pelvic floor ascension. So this is where they're trying to go. If they can't get there, they're gonna do it compensatorily. Um, can you just reiterate gait again on an athlete squat, what that will look like when they're biased towards counter mutation versus mutation? How's that relate to, sure. Um, so let's talk squat. So you start off, you're here, your ER, your uh, anomalies are an ER abduction and flexion. You're, um, your pelvis is counter mutated more so, or it should be. So you start off here, your femurs are in, are in more ER. As you progress towards 90 degrees of hip flexion, your sacrum comes forward into mutation and your anominates go into that compression mechanics, IR extension, adduction. Now your femurs here have more room for IR. Now I'm assuming again, there's no secondary compensations going on. This person has access to these things. Beyond 90 degrees, we start to re-counter mutate this sacrum is gonna tip back into extension, counter mutation, and then you're gonna have more ER activity here, and you're gonna drop, hopefully, astagrass in that squat. For the valgus guy with groin pain, what movements would you recommend? 
I would recommend uh, this individual finds more compressive mechanics. I would recommend you take him through that assessment, verify that he is indeed biased towards expansion. Think about doing goblet squats to a 90 degree box with the ball in between the knees. Think about doing more uh, mid stance stuff with him. Think about progressing him towards late stance, more of that uh, late propulsion where they can really produce force. Any other questions? These are fun. Yes, this will be on YouTube as soon as this is over, for sure. So Connor, I have a question because I've seen it twice now with myself and someone else who's a powerlifter. Their leg, like we're essentially ER'd proximally, but our feet are both, pro like our feet are pronating. And if you look at our calcaneuses, they're everting despite everything else is externally rotating. Mm -hmm. Yes. So how would you kind of like take that on? So this is what I see all the time. If you are compressed, you are supposed to have more IR, a deduction and extension, but you just rarely see that. And that's the thing. So what happens is they become compressed and compressed and compressed and their sacrum mutates forward. And when you put load on a system, when you're a power lifter, Load is inherently compressive. External loads force you to compress, especially when you're doing your, your Valsalva and your, your bracing all the time. You're basically forcing more compression onto a compressed system. Your adductors attach here. So you have this big compressive strategy which pulls your pelvis forward. Now when my pelvis is forward like this, I don't have any more room to IR, but I have plenty of room to go into ER. So they pick up ER, and that's why you see more powerlifters with more ER than IR almost every single time, because they have secondary compensations. And then, they, then whatever the tibia does, sometimes the tibia follows the femur, sometimes it turns against it for stability. It depends on that individual's lifestyle factors. And then you end up with a calcaneus that usually looks like that. Would you start with the feet then in that situation? I would start here. And I would work with the feet. I mean, it's, I mean, everything I would do has foot and pelvic references. So it's all kind of like, uh, it's kind of like a top down and bottom up in, in one way. Gotcha. These are great questions, guys. Keep them coming if you have any. With your initial assessments, are you testing active range of motion or passive? So all those tests are active and I chose those for a specific reason because I don't know if you guys do online, I don't know if you do in person, right now it's coronavirus, so I figure you guys probably might do some online stuff. Um, that's just a really easy way to do it without having to touch someone or get close to them. So all of them are active, but you could do passive and I do do passive, which I cover in the um, biomechanics course as well. Would you recommend expansion strategy for someone who's a left AIC, right BC pattern? That's a great question. I go into high amounts of detail in, in the course. Um, so the left side, left pelvis tends to be more expanded than the right. So I don't care if you're a wide or narrow ISA. I don't care if you're more biased towards compression or expansion. You can be compressed in a left AIC. You can be expanded in a left AIC. So I want to get them first. I want to remove the layer of compensation, right? So if they're uh, let's say compressed left AIC and they're bilaterally extended. I am going to want to bring their pelvis back first and then address this left AIC pattern. So let's say they're compressed bilaterally and anterior pelvic tilt. I got to restore probably IR on both sides because they're probably missing it. Bring that pelvis back. Then you can start to think about giving more compression to the left and more expansion on the right. Do you end up testing hip ER IR? Uh, yeah, I do sometimes, but usually those three tests are my heavy hitters and they're gonna give me a big, big indication of what's going on in the lower body at least. And generally if someone's hips are locked up and they're missing IR in their pelvis, they're probably missing IR in their shoulders too. Um, similarly speaking for the upper body and ER. So I will use that when I'm like, I'm not positive, I need to find out more detail than I will. Uh, but generally, I, I don't use it every time. Any other questions?
keep them coming. I'm sure everyone has the same question you do if you do have a question. Is there anything you guys want me to go over again? I would be happy to do that as well. Okay. I'm going to give it a couple more minutes if I don't have any other questions and you guys are free to go whenever. Again, I appreciate you guys coming. I had a lot of fun doing this. I hope you did too. Thanks, Adam. Can you speak quickly about the relative sacral motion and how that influences pelvis? Yes, I would love to. So sacrum comes forward, right? So that is um, flexion of the sacrum, nutation. That is going to be associated with this right here. And nominate extension, adduction, internal rotation. If you look at from the side, that's gonna increase my lumbar arch. And conversely, I'm probably going to have a bigger thoracic kyphosis, thoracic rounding. These are your power lifters, right? These are your big, heavy, big, heavy um, kind of like curves. Now, if you're going to be more expanded, counter-nutated, that's going to be more abduction, flexion, um, external rotation here. So now you're going to have more of a flat back. This is going to be like, if you, this makes perfect sense if you think about all your sort of like uh, younger, thinner female clients. They're kind of biased towards this position right here. But if you have your bigger dudes, they're going to be more biased towards this position here. And that's just, hey, that's just genetics, right? That's just how human beings are. You guys remember Q angle? Females have a higher Q angle? Well, it's because of this right here. See how this would work? As opposed to, you're not going to have such a Q angle in that position. Can you go back over the unilateral lower expansion progression? Yes, I absolutely can do that. Let me share my screen. Uh, unilateral. So using this Zercher split squat with a backwards hip shift to bias me towards early stance. I might elevate the front heel too, but sometimes I try not to get too crazy with the first progression. It just feels like a lot for people usually. So after that, I'm going to go towards a front foot elevated split squat in early stance. So I'm going to do that backwards hip shift to bias me towards early stance. Ipsilateral load or an ipsilateral reach will help me bias myself towards more early stance. Let's check it out. If I'm here and I hip shift, and I hip shift, that's gonna be more mid stance. But if I'm here and I reach with my other hand, then I get that backwards hip shift bias and I can get more expansion on this pelvis. Then I do a mid stance. So I'm going to forward hip shift, hold the weight in my other hand, and then I'm gonna be able to bias myself towards that compression, vertical tibia angle. After that, rear foot elevated with a bilateral load, and I could do a backwards hip shift to get even more glute max abductor activity. Backward and forward hip shift, right. So, a backwards hip shift would be this, moving my pelvis off of my femur, like that. So what I'm doing is I'm pushing my front leg for my front knee forward, and I'm pulling my back knee backwards. Whereas a actual forward hip shift is this front knee coming back and the back knee coming forward, like that. This is AV doctor internal rotators. This is more blue max AB doctors. Can a hip extension come from internal rotation at one side and external rotation on the other side at the hips during a sprint start during the drive phase? I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, Nick. So hip extension, let's think about what hip extension is, right? So. Hip extension is going to be more of that posterior pelvic orientation rather than a forward anterior one. So when you want hip extension, generally you want the proximal fibers of the hamstring working, right? So that's going to be more associated with what? That's going to be more associated with that mid stance. So I hope that answers your question, which is that internal rotation. 
because hip extension is associated with extension internal rotation adduction. For athletes who stay much time in a split stance position, do you have any? Yeah, yeah, I do, and I have a lot of thoughts on that, especially with how asymmetry plays into that. If you think about the left AIC position, like the pelvis is more forward on the left than the right. Look at MMA fighters. Look at uh, wide receivers in football. They all, they all, I'm telling you, have that left foot forward more, and that's just because of that position. So. Uh, well, I think that's great. We need to make them strong in that position. We also don't want them to get too biased in that position. So I really do like to train some people asymmetrically if they need it. And I go into detail with that in my course for sure. Um, do you recommend any particular biomechanics books? I do. I do. Let me go grab them. If you guys like general biomechanics, I recommend this book right here. If you guys like gate mechanics, I recommend this book right here. I can send these in the email if you want me to. Any other questions? Neil Hollinen, HA, I'll type it right here. Neil, H-A-L-L-A-N-I-N. Oh, wait. I, actually, it might be. Yeah, I think it's that. <laughs> I should know. I've had him on my podcast. Anything else? Going once. Going twice. Thanks, Ashley. I appreciate that. Do you use diaphragmatic breathing often at the start of these progressions when training for expansion of the pelvis? Yeah, I mean, like everything I do is is diaphragmatic breathing. That's that's really what I care about a lot. So um, with diaphragmatic breathing, you want something called a zone of apposition, which means can you keep your ribs, your low ribs relatively down as you inhale, which is going to, air follows the path of least resistance, right? So if you want your diaphragm to work, you want to be able to expand everything around here. So the belly, chest rises in unison, and then you have expansion back here, right? So it can't be like all the air going here, or all the air going here or all the air going here, it needs to be everything expands at once. That's diaphragmatic breathing. So we can do that usually by exhaling, feeling our obliques, and then inhaling, and then everything expands at once. It's hard to see with this loose shirt on, but yeah, I really do care about diaphragmatic breathing a lot, and you can use diaphragmatic breathing to get more compression or expansion depending on what you're looking for. Yeah, thanks. I was wondering whether we can get extension from hip IR and adduction. Um, so if we're talking about late propulsion, I do not want internal rotation activity happening a lot. I do want that pelvis moving off of the femur. So I would want to train more glute max abductors. But if we're going for hip extension, then yeah, I do want that internal rotation activity. All right, guys, I got about a couple more minutes, then I got to run out of here because I have to be, I have an hour drive coming up. Thanks, Trevor. I appreciate it, man. Thank you, guys. All right. I will see you all later.